of my father. For whom it is prepared of my father, Matthew 20, 23. So as we continue to look at the left hand of God, the touch of intimacy, we see in Song of Solomon, chapter two, verse six, his left hand is under my head and his right hand embraces me. The position of the Shulamite in Song of Solomon in this passage we just looked at, resting in the embrace of her beloved is a posture of the believer's communion with Christ. St. John 13 gives us an account of an intimate fellowship between the disciples and Jesus. The final moments before the events leading up to Christ's crucifixion, he truly, truly loved his disciples. He loved them. These were the individuals that he served with, walked with for three years. He ate with them. He taught them. And now the time was at hand for him to be separated from them by crucifixion. It was during this period that Jesus washed his disciples' feet. He predicted his betrayal. He comforted his disciples. And he promised the Holy Spirit and prayed for them. Jesus knew on the evening of the Passover day that it would be his last night on the earth before returning to his father. And so during the supper, the devil had already suggested to Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, that this was the night to carry out his plan to betray Jesus. Jesus knew that the father had given him everything and that he had come from God and would return to God and how he loved his disciples, John 13. So he got up, verse four, he got up from the supper table, took off his robe, wrapped a towel around his loins. He poured water into a basin and he began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel he had around them. He touched their feet. When he came to Simon Peter, Peter said to him, Master, you shouldn't be washing our feet like this. Jesus replied, you don't understand now why I am doing it, but someday you will. No, Peter protested, you shall never wash my feet. Jesus replied, but if I don't, you can't be my partner. Simon Peter replied, he exclaimed actually, then wash my hands and my head as well, not just my feet. After washing their feet, he put on his robe again and sat down and asked, do you understand what I was doing? Do you know what I have done for you? You call me teacher and Lord. This is well said, for I am. So if I, your Lord and your teacher, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. I have given you an example to follow. Do as I have done to you. How true it is that a servant is not greater than his master nor the messenger more important than the one who sends him. So tonight we want to look at the three positions of a lover. What are the three positions of a lover? This is not in comparison to the 10 positions that we looked at uh, by Minister Marlon, but what are the three positions of a lover uh, as, we, um, as, we, as we receive and enjoy the touch of intimacy? The first position we want to look at is to linger is to linger. Jesus lingered with the disciples. And we can see that it was his last night with them and he was just having that time of fellowship, you know, and he lingered with them. The position of the lover is to linger, to stay in a place longer than necessary because of your reluctance to leave. The length of time that a hug, for example, is given is determined by the level of intimacy between those who are hugging. The hug of a brother, is different from that of a husband. The length of our embrace is determined by the nature of the relationship and the existing circumstances. So for example, if there's a long separation, that would determine the length of time someone might, might hug a sibling. You might never hug your sibling, but if they have been separated for a long time and you meet them at the airport, for example, after a long stay away, I am sure that your hug would be longer than normal. So, we will first look at Mary, a desire to, like Mary, linger at his feet in spite of the hustle and bustle all around you. Nothing, not even duty, 
for Jesus, not even responsibility for him was going to shift her from her position with him. We looked at that last night. Mary sat on the floor listening to Jesus for some time. She soaked in all that she could of his presence. She positioned herself for mercy. She created a space for grace. Time was not of the essence. I mean, time stopped for her. She was just in the presence of her savior, her Lord, her lover. She just wanted to be where Jesus was, dwelling in his presence. The psalmist David in Psalm 27 tells us that his desire is just to spend time meditating in his temple, living in his presence every day of my life. Psalm 119, 67 says, I have searched, I have looked for your commands, and I love them very much. And we looked last night at, at, at the whole aspect of the scent of the word of God. As we spend that time in his word, the scent that comes around us because of that time in his presence. Yes, the psalmist said, I have searched for them. You know this because everything I do is known to you. And let me tell you, searching requires time. You can recall anything you've looked for. You, you, you're trying to find something that you've misplaced. And you know the time. It was important. You needed it for an interview the next day. Or you needed it for, for something. And you took the time to search. There was nothing that prevented you from searching. That's the kind of intent that we need as we search for God. The intent to look for, to search, to, to, to be just, just wanting to be in his presence. And time stands still. Your desire to linger will not be understood by those around you. You remember blind Bartimaeus? He had a passion. He had a desire for Jesus. And he longed for him. He reached out. He yearned for. He wanted to be with him. And what did the people around him say? Shut up. <laughs> Many rebuked him and told him to be quiet. But he shouted all the more. Nothing was going to prevent him from seeking out and going after this man called Jesus, son of David. He said, have mercy on me. So he searched for him. You remember the children who wanted to see Jesus? They had a desire to see him, a desire for his touch. What did the disciples say? Don't bother him. <laughs> Mary was soaking up his presence. And what did Martha, her sister, say? Come and help me do some work because right now you're not doing anything. <laughs> So, you know, the desire to and the intent and our, our, our intention to spend time with Jesus will sometimes be seen as doing nothing by others. But we have to ensure we know what we want. We know what we want to achieve. We know what we want to accomplish. We want to receive that touch, that touch from the master, that touch from the lover of our souls. So we have to do everything in our power to ensure that we position ourselves to receive that touch from him. When you spend that quality time with the lover of your soul, there is an afterglow that envelops you. You remember Moses, who was on the mountain with the Lord for 40 days and 40 nights? His face glowed from being in the presence of God. So there's an afterglow when you spend time in the presence of God. There's, there's a sister that I have. Uh, whenever I, there are times when I will, you know, probably visit knock on her door. And when she opens the door, when I see her face, I just say, you've been spending time with the Lord, haven't you? She says, yes. There's just a glow. There's just something about your countenance when you have come in contact with and you, you, there's, there's a touch from the master. You know, after we make love, do we linger in the presence of our spouse or do we just roll over like a satisfied puppy? Or do we hustle to the bathroom to wash off? Do we enjoy the company of our spouse? Do we linger in the company of our spouse? My experience during worship, um, I want to share with you one, one experience I had. Um, we, were in, we were making a procession up the hill of the Lord. The worship leader was taking us somewhere, a place where she herself had already been. As worship leaders, you, you, you need to be where you want the people to come in worship. So my eyes were closed. You know, I, I was playing the keyboard at the time and I was just worshiping and enjoying the experience. And the Holy Spirit's presence was just so real. 
And I was following the worship leader's lead as well as the prompt of the Holy Spirit. And what was happening is that the worship leader would pause. And as she paused, the Lord would drop a song in my spirit. And as I started to play that song, she would lead in that song. Nothing planned. It was just a beautiful flow. And the weight of God's glory was tangible. You knew that the glory of God was filling the tabernacle. At some point, there was another pause. My eyes were closed. I wasn't looking. I was just sensing what the Lord was doing. And my eyes were closed. And I sensed there was another pause. So I just thought that she was, you know, just waiting for another download from the Lord in terms of where to go. And I suddenly heard the chairperson's voice saying, we thank the Lord for this time of worship. And I was like, I was shocked out of my, you know, and I opened my eyes and I looked at the worship leader and she shrugged. And I knew that the leader had indicated that she needed to stop because the time, her time was up. She had 15 minutes, 20 minutes, and the time was up. Well, as soon as I could, after, you know, I could, I hurried into the office, the church office. And while the service continued with the message and other things they were doing, I continued to worship the Lord until there was a release of his spirit over me and I broke down. You know, it was a beautiful experience in his presence. And I knew that had we continued in corporate worship, there would have been a powerful manifestation of his spirit. The glory of the Lord would have indeed come down and filled that temple. There was no desire to linger. It was just a program, it's just a time. We worship for 15 minutes and then we go on to this and then we do this. May the Lord forgive us as leaders for keeping our services within rigid timeframes to the neglect of the free movement of the spirit. So we need to linger. If we want to experience, hallelujah, if we want to experience the touch of the lover of our souls, we need to understand that one of our positions is to linger. We have to linger in his presence. We have to linger. We have to wait. We have to wait on him. We don't determine when he is to come. We don't say, okay, this, within this 15 minute time period, this is when you are to come. We just need to linger. We just need to wait. And even as he's here with us on the platform, let us just talk to him and ask him to help us to appreciate him and to spend more time in his presence to linger when we need to linger and not hurry off because we want to hustle here and to hustle there, but just to make him the priority. Just to say, this is your time, have your way, have your way, have your way. The second position that we need to experience is that we need to lean. We need to lean on our lover. John leaned on his bosom. So the position of the lover is to lean on, not just to linger, but to lean on, to rest, to find comfort, assurance, support, affirmation, confidence in our spouse, confidence in our relationship. When was the last time that you leaned on your spouse? When was the last time that you allowed your spouse to lean on you? Sometimes we lean on the wrong things or we lean on the wrong persons and this affects our intimacy with the Lord. How is this? So if you are leaning on something or someone else, it means that you have leaned away from the Lord. You remember in Isaiah 36 verse 6, the Lord said, Egypt is a dangerous ally. You are relying on Egypt. That splintered reed of a staff it will enter and puncture the palm of anyone who leans on it. That's what Pharaoh king of Egypt is like to all who rely on him. This is the experience of anyone who looks to Egypt for help. In 2 Kings 18, 20 to 21, we also see a similar reference. You need more than mere promises of help before rebelling against me. But which of your allies will give you more than words? Egypt, if you lean on Egypt, you will find her to be a stick that breaks under your weight and pierces your hand. The Egyptian Pharaoh is totally unreliable. That's what happens when you lean on unreliable sources. Not just that they break, 
but as a result of the break, what is left will puncture and pierce your hand. Sometimes we lean on persons whose source is not the Lord. In 2 Kings 5.18, we see the account of the, 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 the servant of Naaman who was healed. Naaman was healed and the servant said to the prophet, however, may the Lord pardon me this one thing. When my master, the king, goes into the temple of God, Rimon, to worship there and leans on my arm, may the Lord pardon me when I bow too. You all understand that context. Sometimes we lean on our own understanding. The word of God advises us not to lean on our understanding because when we do, there'll be areas of our life that are not focused on being intimate with the Lord. Those areas in which we lean on our own understanding, it means we have leaned away from the Lord and his advice and his counsel. And it affects our worship. In whatever area we are not leaning on the Lord, we have not submitted and surrendered that area to him. Verse 23 of the passage in John that we're looking at, John 13, gives us a glimpse into the position of one of the disciples. Now there was leaning on Jesus's bosom, one of his disciples whom Jesus loved. They were reclining at dinner and guests reclined on the couches, leaning on the left elbow with the head towards the table. Because of how this disciple was positioned, he was able to lean back against Jesus to ask a question on Simon Peter's behalf, verses 24 to 25. Peter's leaning spoke volumes of the confidence that he had in his relationship with Jesus. We see in Song of Solomon, the young girl finding affirmation and assurance as she leans on her beloved. Who is this coming up from the wilderness, leaning on her beloved, leaning on the one she loves? So the positions of the lover, we are to linger in the presence of our lover. We are to lean on our lover. And thirdly, we need to long for our lover. Paul longed to know Christ. The position of the lover is to long for, to yearn for. Paul's longing was to know Christ and the power of the resurrection, of his resurrection. The supreme longing of the Christian should be to know Christ, to know him personally and intimately, to know him experientially in the power of his resurrection. You might say, of course, I know Jesus. Yes, he's my creator and sustainer. Yes, but do you know Jesus? Yes, he's a good man. He's a healer. But do you really know Jesus? Yes, he was crucified. He died for my sins. He's my savior. Yes, but have you come to the place where you know that you know that you know that there is none like him? For him, all the pleasures of sin, you resign. When you make the effort and take the time, you will find him. The apostle Paul wrote in Philippians 3.10, I want to know Christ and the power of his resurrection. For my determined purpose is that I may know him, that I may progressively become more deeply and intimately acquainted with him, perceiving and recognizing and understanding the wonders of his person more strongly and more clearly. And that I may in that same way come to know the power outflowing from his resurrection, which he exerts over believers. Paul's prayer in Ephesians 1.17 is that we may come to know Christ better. I want to know Christ. I want to know him and the power of his resurrection. The word know refers to empirical knowledge. It is Knowledge beyond the shadow of a doubt. It is knowing that you know, that you know, that you know. And such knowledge is born out of experience. Experience that is now revelation. Knowing Christ must surpass sentimental, idealistic admiration of a person. In the Old Testament, to know someone was to go into someone. It had a sexual connotation. So too, we must go into the heart of Jesus deeper and deeper penetrating that love of Jesus I go seeking to know the reason why he should love me so deeper and deeper into the love of Jesus deeper let me go till my life 
till my soul, till my mind is wholly lost in Jesus. The song says, sweet will of God, still fold me closer till I am wholly lost in him. I want to know him. Jeremiah 9 says, thus says the Lord, let not the wise and skillful person glory and boast in his wisdom and skill. Let not the mighty and powerful person glory and boast in his strength and power. Let not the person who is rich in physical gratification and earthly wealth glory and boast in his temporal satisfactions and earthly riches. Verse 24 says, Jeremiah 9, but let him who glories glory in this. This is what he's supposed to boast about. This is what he's supposed to go out tomorrow boasting about. That he understands and knows the Lord personally, practically, directly discerning and recognizing Christ's character. Boast that he is Lord who practices loving kindness, judgment and righteousness in the earth. For in these things I delight, says the Lord. The Lord delights in the fact that you can boast in him, that you boast that you have been found in him. You can boast that you know him. Knowing God is more than just knowing about God. Even the, the demons know about him. To know Christ is to love him. And to love him is to do what he says. If you're not obeying God, you are not loving him. It is as simple as that. If you're not obeying him, you are not loving him. It's two sides of the same coin. Loving God and obeying God. Two sides of the same coin. God says through his word, forgive as I have forgiven you. So if you have not forgiven your spouse for, for whatever your spouse has done, then it means that you're not loving God because God's command is that we forgive as he has forgiven us. If you're not being kind and compassionate and gentle with each other, you're not loving God because God says, be kind and compassionate. The word of God says, do not let the sun go down on your wrath. Loving God means that you are obeying God, two sides of the same coin. To be positioned with your lover means that you're demonstrating your love through your obedience to Christ. This is one way in which you indicate that you have experienced the touch of the lover of your soul. As we get to know the lover of our souls, it's about what he wants. He wants your time. He wants your talent. He wants your treasure. A necessary shift from being self-centered to being centered in Christ and what he longs for. If there are struggles with obeying God and doing what he wants you to do, then it means that self is still on the throne. When Paul wrote, I want to know Christ, he had already known Christ for 30 years. His longing was to know the mind, the heart, the love, the friendship of Christ in an ever developing degree, intimacy with God. Christopher Columbus discovered the Americas, but there are still unmanned lakes, minerals and treasures yet to be found. So we need to continue our exploration of Christ. Examine his scars. Have you examined his scars lately? The scars that he took for you, the scars on his hand, the scars on his feet, the scars on his back where he was beaten. Have you examined those scars and caressed those scars and continue to discover new treasures in Christ? Song of Solomon 2.6, his left hand is under my head and his right hand embraces me. There's some things that we notice about an embrace. First of all, an embrace can be spurned or substituted. So let's look at that. An embrace can be spurned or substituted. All right, so when we look, that's what we can respond. We can either spurn an embrace or substitute. <laughs> Secondly, an embrace offers three things. It offers solace or comfort. Psalm 1952 says, your word has been my comfort. And that's what an embrace does. It offers solace, comfort. Here I am, experience a touch 
of the master, the touch of the lover of your soul, the touch of your lover. An embrace also offers security, Psalm 91. David understood as he lingered in the secret place of the Most High, he would be under the protective shade of the Lord. It's a benefit for those under the contract. The contract is he who dwells in the secret place. That's the contract and the benefits. You shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. Come under the protective shade. Come into, con uh, into, into covenant relationship with the Lord. So an embrace offers solace. It offers security. And thirdly, it offers support, assurance of relationship. Martha and Mary were in the same home. There were two sisters in the same home, in the presence of the same Lord, but had two different experiences. Martha was told, I am not going to honor your request to have Mary leave my presence. Like, wow, she has found something and I'm not going to take it from her. That was response of God to Mary, for, sorry, to Martha. What was his response to Mary? Mary was told he is here and he wants to see you. So Mary went to him at once and fell down at his feet. There was no need for any teaching, no foundational truth. She didn't need two choruses to warm her up. She was able to bow down and embrace God in the midst of her grief. Like Job, it was a familiar posture. So let us ensure that we, we, are, we are practicing being in the presence of and receiving the touch of the Lord. So as we prepare for our time of prayer, our intercession today, wives, I wanted to lean into your spouse as you are sitting together tonight. Lean on your spouse. Husbands, receive the leaning of your spouse. And as you position yourselves also before the lover of your souls, release your souls into the embrace of the Lord. Let us take the time to nurture. Let us take the time to linger with the lover of our souls and our lovers. Let us take the time to long for, and let us take the time to lean on our spouse. So as we listen to this song and prepare our hearts for worship. Give you glory. And we give you honor. Hallelujah. Lord, I'm amazed at the way you care for me. For it's higher than the highest I can be. Lord, I'm amazed at the way you care for me like a father with his son you teach me how to see lord i know that there have been times when i didn't know what to do and the word ahead was hard for me to see. But you held me in your arms and you wiped away my tears and you took me in your arms and fathered me, fathered me. Fathered me, oh, you fathered me, oh, Father. So many times, Lord, your love and your compassion, you have poured out on your children. And you fathered us. We thank you tonight, Lord, for the opportunity to be in your presence. We thank you tonight, Lord, for your grace that is sufficient. We thank you tonight, Lord, for your arms that are around us, for your embrace, oh God. Lord, we come to you this evening to thank you to lift you up, to glorify you. 
And Father, we want to bring the couples on this platform to you tonight. We want, God, that at the end of this session, Lord, they would have experienced your embrace. Father, they would have experienced your touch. Spirit of the living God, we lift the couples to you even now. Father, there were some that may be broken. There are some tonight, God, that are struggling in their relationship with you. They're struggling in their marriage, oh God. Father, we ask you tonight in the name of Jesus to embrace that wife, to embrace that husband that seems to be stuck, that seems to not know where to go, and that seems to not understand what they're going through. Father, in the name of Jesus, embrace them and draw them close to you, Father, that they may experience you. And in experiencing you, God, they will come to an understanding, oh God, of who you are and what you, what you desire for them. And Father, as they experience you and, and your desire, they will be able to, to, to experience, oh God, their spouse and, and share love and, and affection with their spouse. Father, we know God without a shadow of a doubt that you're able, you're a God who is able. And oh God, I just lift, Father, the spouses on this platform tonight that are hurting. The, 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 the spouses tonight, God, that are need healing, they're needing healing in the inner man, oh God. Father, you robo sotoro Oh my God. I ask you tonight, Lord, to reach down and to, to scoop them up as it were in your arms, Lord. That the pain and the and and, and, and the, 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 the the sores of, of life that seem not to be able to heal, oh God. I ask you, Lord God Almighty, to be that balm in Gilead that they need in the name of Jesus. Where they're feeling alone, Father, let them experience your presence. Overwhelm them with your love. Overwhelm them, oh God, in your grace. Father, dry the tears. Dry the tears. Put the fight back in them again in the name of Jesus. Put the joy back into their hearts, oh God. Where they are weak, Father, strengthen them. Father them, Daddy, Father them. Father them, Daddy, even now, Lord God Almighty. As a little child looks up to her father who seems like a giant, when he lifts her up, oh God, and she feels safe, Father, let these couples, when they, when you lift them up out of their struggle, when you lift them out, oh God, out of their pain, out of their hurts, Father, in the name of Jesus, may they feel safe and secure. And in feeling safe and secure in you, God, they can be, oh God, the support that they need to be for each other. They can be, oh God 
the one God that each other, that they can lean into each other, Father. Spirit of the living God. Minister tonight in ways that may not seem logical, in ways that may not seem normal. Because some of the circumstances that, that these couples are facing in their eyes, it's not normal. And so God, they need a need intervention that does not look normal. They need a touch, they need a word that can come from no one else but from you, Father. They need an embrace Father, that can come from no one else but you, Daddy. Lord, I pray in the name of Jesus that husbands and wives tonight will learn to linger in your presence and to linger in each other's presence. They will learn to tap into you, Daddy. They will learn to draw from your word and draw from your presence so that the healing that needs to take place, the, 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 the direction that they need, oh God, they will know that it is coming from you as they linger in your presence, as they wait on you, as they depend on you, Father. Spirit of the living God, teach, teach them tonight how to linger. As the words that were shared tonight, as the teaching was shared tonight, God, may it play back in their minds over and over as they learn the art of lingering in you presence and lingering with each other. Father, help them to lean in on each other. To be the support, to be the strength. To be, oh God, the voice. The encouragement because Father, the reality is that you have created couples, Lord, to be one and, and, and in being one, Father, there needs to be that connection where they can just communicate, sometimes without even speaking. Father, some couples have lost that along the way. Oh God, would you, would you rekindle, would you rekindle? Would you rekindle for them the things that they have lost? Would you rekindle it for them, Father, in the name of Jesus? Spirit of the living God, I ask you tonight, Father, to reach out and to minister that wife that is on this platform that wants to give up, that wants to throw in the towel, that wife that is feeling as though there's nothing, nothing left for her in the marriage, in the relationship. Father, I pray in the name of Jesus, that you would remove the scales from her eyes and help her to understand, oh God, that when you are in the marriage, reconciliation is possible. Father, I pray, God, that you will soothe her heart, that you would strengthen her, you would give her, oh God, a new zeal and a new desire 
And God, I ask that her husband, that he too will fight for his marriage. He will not be willing to let go, but he would go the extra mile. He will do that extra that is needed that you're prompting him to do, Father. That he will linger a little longer so that she would know, she would know that there is hope. Spirit of the living God, minister, Holy Spirit, minister, Lord God Almighty. Let not the enemy get victory in this, but you'll be glorified. You'll be glorified. You'll be glorified. Yes, Lord. In the name of Jesus, you'll Amen. be glorified. Hallelujah. Jesus. Glory be to God. Father, we continue to tarry in your presence. Lord, we express our gratitude to you. We thank you, Lord, for your woman servant who have poured in our lives tonight. Jesus. And we pray, God, that you will replenish. Pastor Woodbank, you Pastor Woodbank, you'll replenish her, oh God, with everything that she has invested tonight over these few weeks. Yes, Lord. We pray, God, that you will continue to minister to each individual, to each couple, that individually, God, we will seek to draw closer to you to tarry in your presence, to look to you, to embrace you and allow you to embrace us. And God, as we draw closer to you, we will become better husbands, better wives, better parents, better couples. And you and you alone will be exalted and glorified in our lives. So, Father, we pray that you will teach us how to lean on you, yes. how to lean truly on each other, yes. to embrace one another as we have allowed you to embrace us, mm -hmm. O oh God Almighty. Mm -hmm. Father, we need you more. We need you more, King Jesus. We need you in our marriages. We need you in our individual lives. We need you, Lord, in our church, in our homes, in our society. Yes. Oh, Father in heaven, May it be a time of relaxation, a time of joy. As your word declare, Moses' face glow, shined. Yes. May we to experience your presence where continents will shine and glow. May our faces glow when we spend time with our wives and our husband in your presence. Yes, Lord. Yes. Oh, Father, we pray and declare and decree blessings, a spirit of leaning, a spirit of embracing more and more upon each couple represent here tonight. Forgive us, oh God. Cleanse us, oh God for not leaning more on you, yes, yes. for not leaning more on each other. Jesus. Our dependence is on you, Daddy. Tonight, Lord, 
May we put our heads on your breast and hear your heart's beat. May we as husband and wives be willing to put our heads on his other's breast and hear their hearts beat. Yes, Lord. May our marriages grow, may our marriages increase, may our marriages be fruitful and successful. That you, O oh God, will be glorified. Our children, our neighbors, our church family will see the difference in our lives and they will know it is God who lives in us, who is our master, our teacher. Father, we need you today more than we did yesterday. Visit every couple tonight. Minister to each one of us. Help us to see our wrong where we have failed, you where we have failed each other. And to submit to you, Lord, we will commit our lives to you. We will commit and submit every marriage to you yes. tonight, every yes. couple to you, every individual to you. Jesus. That you will work in us individually and collectively. That we will be better servant, better husband, better wife. So, Father, we bless you tonight. Thank you, we ask, Father, in the name of Jesus that you will hide us under the shadow of your wings. Yes. Embrace us, O oh God, with your love and teach us to embrace one another. This is our humble prayers in the mighty name of Amen. Jesus. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Amen.